Is it culturally okay to start early here? <laughs> no? <laughs> I'll be in trouble from the get-go if I start early? Okay. I packed a lot in here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I think we'll be we'll Vice President of Product Development for IHS. Uh, IHS is, uh, we have a, an office here in Bangalore. We're a global company. Uh, data and analytics is our area of expertise, particularly a uh, strong position in oil and gas, and then um, a lot of areas in the vertical in the supply chain very close to oil and gas, automotive, technology, chemicals, uh, defense, and aerospace. Um, we are probably a company that you have certainly heard from, but probably have no idea who we are. Um, we're the ones that are behind the scenes. We're reporting on forecasts of oil and gas prices, a lot of the economic risk. Um, if there's something in dealing with analytics and forecasting, uh, most likely IHS has been involved. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, myth-busting software estimation. Uh, how many people are familiar with myth, myth Busters? It's an American TV program. Okay. Um, the idea of these guys get a couple of scientists, they get together and they design really cool experiments, uh, usually involving explosives and blowing things up, in order to take a look at myths and figure out whether the, those myths are real or not. Um, I wanted to do that. I asked Naresh, can I get a really big budget and blow things up? He said, sorry, it's not going to work. So. Instead of blowing things up, what I'm going to do is go and look at real data. As much as possible, go with real scientific data. There's a lot of postulation of different ideas out there. That's what creates many of these myths. Um, I'm going to try to take a look at some real data, some data, my own data, uh, other data from other researchers, to actually take a look at a lot of, of uh, the various myths that we have. Uh, we tend to have a lot of them in software estimation. So. As a good agilist, what we're going to start with is test first. So with the Mythbusters, when the Mythbusters get together, they look and they have three potential outcomes. Uh, either it's busted, the myth is, is absolutely not true, uh, it's confirmed the myth, or they go on the you know, in between and say it might be plausible. So I'm going to go through it. We'll start with 10 myths, and uh, then we'll go through them each one. So the first one. Estimation challenges are well understood by general management, project management, and teams, and it's normal to be able to expect estimate, to estimate projects within 25% accuracy. How many people think that's absolutely true? <laughs> come on. How come when I ask my team, they say, absolutely, it's going to be done? No problem, sir. <laughs> ah, OK. So now, you, OK, how many people think it's, it's, it's going to be busted? Mostly. How many people think it's plausible? All right, maybe. Okay. All right. Keep moving on. Uh, whoops. I'm having trouble with it. What's going on? All right. All right. Uh, estimation accuracy significantly improves as the project progresses. How many people think that's confirmed? All right. How many people think that that's, that's busted? Okay, and how many people think it's plausible? Okay. Estimations are frequently impacted by biases, and these biases can be significant. Confirmed? Busted? Okay. We're pretty good at estimating things relatively. How many think that's confirmed? How about uh, busted? Four people busted. Okay. Plausible. All right. Okay. Velocity or throughput are some good tools for adjusting estimates. Think that's a good idea. Confirm. Busted. Plausible. All right. Okay. All right, this one's good. We're a bit behind, but we'll make it up in testing since most of our, most of our uncertainty was in the features. <laughs> Don't even need to ask. <laughs> All right, who's, who's going who's gonna to be that hero developer that makes it up in testing? Okay. Uh, seven, scope creep is a major source of estimation error. Oh, uh, yeah, sounds like, sounds like that one's an easy one. Uh, eight, having more estimators, even when they're not ex experts, can improve estimation accuracy. Busted? You think it's busted? What's that? Any, how many confirmed? All right. 
Project success is determined by, by on-time delivery. Success is on-time delivery? No. Nope. Busted? Busted, mostly busted. All right. And number 10, estimation is waste. <laughs> Confirmed? <laughs> All right. We're going to have some fun. OK, first one, estimation challenges are well understood by general management, project management, and teams. Now, what do you think about that one? Well, you've heard this before, but uh, I've got to do it again. And even if I've done this 100 times, I still, I still have fun with this one. So we have our little st beginning of our story, the project kickoff. We have our poor little Dorothy saying, when will we get the requirements? All in good time, my little pretty. All in good time. But I guess it doesn't matter anyway. Just give me your estimates by this afternoon. <laughs> the team binds together. Not so fast. Not so fast. I'll have to give the matter a little thought. Go away and come back tomorrow. No, we need something today. OK, then it'll be two years. <laughs> no, we need it sooner. Doesn't anybody believe me? I already promised the customer it'll be out in six months. You're a very bad man. Oh, we're not in Kansas anymore. The developer hero. I may not come out alive, but I'm going in there. It just about got things under control when a reorganization. The great and powerful Oz has got mad as well in hand. My, people come and go so quickly here. And finally, they get it into testing. <laughs> Going so soon? I wouldn't hear of it. Why, my little party's just beginning. Unfortunately, this happens too often. So, why is software late? Um, I came across, I've done a lot of various research in this area, and came across this paper by uh, Ganunchen in, uh, a while ago, 1991, but I found it pretty interesting because uh, he did something really interesting. He, he surveyed both general managers, the business side of the world, uh, and the project manager, and had a number of different things that came up. And one of the things I'm gonna go through, he, he, they're not quite the same, and I'm gonna highlight a little bit about that, but before I do that, I'd like to give you a little story on the context of feedback. So one of the, there was, during the World War II, um, the British were trying to study, they were doing some advanced data analytics. I think Dave talked about analytics at all these different phases of analytics. They were trying to do analytics on airplanes that were coming back uh, from bombing, bombing uh, episodes in Germany. And they started doing analytics, and they, said, and they did all these wonderful things, and they found some patterns of where the bullets were. And they said, wow, this is pretty cool. All we need to do is reinforce all those places where they're shooting our our airplanes, and our planes will be stronger. And everyone's in agreement. Yes, that's what we need to do. We need to reinforce all those places where, where, where they're shooting us. And a Hungarian mathematician looked at this and said, you've got this all wrong. You've got to remember that these are the planes that have come back from the war. These are the ones that didn't get blown up. You've got to reinforce the places where they didn't get hit because the ones that got hit were, were the ones that got downed, right? The places near the fuel and things like that. So it's the context of feedback. Understand the context of feedback, and this is uh, you know, the types of things we have to do. So in this case, what is our feedback telling us? We're asking a general manager. We're asking a project manager. A couple of places they agreed entirely. Um, call those out in the green ones. They both said, yep, customer management changes were big issues. They also said unrealistic project plans. Yeah, probably, probably pretty much unrealistic. We, we went really aggressive in here. A couple that looked like a little bit different. General manager thought staffing wasn't really a problem. You know, I pretty much gave them all the people and, and all the, the, uh, the money they needed. Project manager said, no, 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 you don't remember when I kept telling you I needed more people, right? Overall complexity. Business side, yeah, no, no, we just asked for this simple little thing. You know, project manager actually had to deliver it. Much higher complexity from their perspective. Um, the other side, insufficient 
general manager says, you know, our only problem is if we would have just done a better job planning, we would all, all of this would have been in great shape. Project manager said, no, planning wasn't our problem. We did as much planning, the right type of planning up front, but things changed along the way. We had to deal with, with that. So more upfront planning wouldn't have made a big difference at all. You've got this disconnect. This disconnect comes out all the time. It's a quote from Upton Sinclair. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. So let's take a look at the Space Shuttle Challenger. When the Space Shuttle blew up, they did a real detailed uh, analysis of this. And they went back and they looked at, you know, what sort of probability of loss of life did we have from this program? And look at it. the engineers. They said that there was about a 1 in 100 chance of loss of life. Management, 1 in 100,000. OK, now what really happened in the Space Shuttle program? 135 flights, two disasters, 14 deaths. What does it tell you? Engineers are optimists. Okay? And management is somewhere in outer space. So let's look at some real data. Um, I was at a company, Landmark Graphics, um, and we, were, we had been collecting a lot of data. Not really, it was more, uh, uh, not really as a program that was focused on anything, just we were collecting data because we were, we were technical geeks and we like to collect data. So we were collecting some data and we had a lot of, lot of data. We were a product company and uh, I'd been doing a little bit of research in this area, reading about on it. So I said, well, let me take a look at our data and see how it compares to the rest of the in industry. Can I, can I validate some of the things out there? So I actually started out with the idea to validate some things. Um, came across a couple of unintended side, side effects. So let me go through a little bit of what I found. First of all, if we want to look at the accuracy of our initial estimate, so I plot the initial estimate on the bottom, and on the, on the uh, y-axis is the actual, what we came out with. If we'd been perfect, we'd be all along that, that uh, magenta line. Well, what do we see? We saw data all over the map, right? Mostly, almost all of it, to the point where the actual ended up taking more than the original estimate, but scattered in a fairly, fairly uh, dispersed pattern. I looked at that. I said, oh, that's sort of interesting. I said, it looks a little bit, a lot like uh, data that I'd seen in a book by Tom DeMarco. So if I look at the data and cross plot the data with uh, data from Tom DeMarco, almost identical pattern. And this was totally different industries and probably 10 or 15 years earlier data. Uh, but that's the pattern uh, that I was seeing. And, and I started looking around and saw this a little bit more. Um, this is a, almost similar data uh, by Steve McConnell that was published in his book. Uh, very, very similar types of patterns. When you actually look at this and then you try to figure out, well, what does this mean? Uh, it sort of boils down to this. About 10 to 20 percent of the projects is what is, is actually what's coming in at or under the initial estimate in, in, in what we're seeing. If I wanted to have a 50 percent confidence, so 50 percent of the project, I'd have to go out twice the estimate. I'd have to double the estimate in order to have a 50 percent confidence of making that of what was based on that initial. And if I want to have a 90% confidence, I've got to get out closer to 4x. So that's the, that's the nature of the, the, uh, the pattern that we see of, an, of what it's actually taking us relative to that early initial estimate. We see a couple of things. We see a very strong optimism bias because we're, we're very optimistic. The other thing is we have no clue as to the range of the uncertainty that we're dealing with. I mean, this is, this is when I have this conversation with people, they have just really no clue about that. They're thinking, oh, plus or minus 25%. I've added 25% contingency. I'm all in great shape. No, you're not even close to great shape. You, know, you haven't even covered the 50% probability case. And this, this pattern of 1 to 4x, I've seen repeated and repeated in data uh, throughout. There are some companies that get better and better at it, and they can get it. About the best I've seen is where they can get the range down to about 2x in that uh, 90% per uh, size. Still much larger than most people expect. Um, we heard, heard Dave talk today about uh, Kinefin framework. Uh, this is a, a plot that I saw from a person, John Helm, who presented at Agile 2013. It explains a little bit of what's going on here, and that is that we have these long tails. We have these log normal type distributions 
that we're facing. And particularly, this is an earlier conversation with Dave about this. Um, and it's a little bit of a, I should bring Dave to tell me to tell this story too, because um, the challenge here is that estimation itself is one of those things we don't tend to be very good at. And when we're not very good at it, the area of, say, the complicated, we might have software development activities which are more in the complicated domain, but if we haven't got the experts and the people who really know how to do it and really know how to do that estimation, we may be actually behaving more like the complex where we have these very long tails. And very long tails are the things that push us out in that, into that 4x category. Some more data. This is some recent data from a guy, Magda Jorgensen, uh, from uh, Sintef in Norway. Uh, I'll actually be using a lot of his data. He's one of the best uh, researchers in this area. Um, I really like this project because he put a software development project out for bid online on a place called uh, vworker.com. Uh, it's a virtual worker environment that bids on these small projects. They received 16 bids for this project, uh, and they, they pre-selected it down to six bids that were from vendors that had a very high client satisfaction. So they're already making sure that they're going to have people that had already started from a high client satisfaction. The piece I really like about this is all six bidders gave their estimates and actually did the project. So we have real data from, from at least six, six people that went and, and did this work. So what we find is that the data is all over the map. The highest estimate to the lowest estimate was a factor of eight to one. Right? The fact that we could try to get, you know, this is, um, this is an amazing range of how, how different we see between uh, projects and, and estimation. If we look at the actual that it took them over the estimate, we see this power of four. If we look at the range, it ranges, one team was actually, one, one group came in at 70% uh, of their original estimate. Uh, another, the worst case one was uh, 2.9. The overall range was about four to one, right? So same, same type of data that we're seeing elsewhere. And then if we look at the actual performance range, the worst team took 18 times that effort of the best. Huge ranges of, of uncertainty, uh, huge ranges in performance. So the idea that we could estimate so much accu so accurately, given the fact that we've got nat this natural uh, uncertainty, uh, is just unrealistic. So are they understood by general management and it should be accurate? I think this one's pretty well busted. So let's look at the next one. Estimation accuracy, accuracy significantly improves as the project progresses. So how does estimation accuracy improve? We have, how many people are familiar with the cone of uncertainty? Oh, not as many as I thought. Okay. So the cone of uncertainty was, was first postulated by uh, Barry Bame, a uh, very, very famous uh, uh, researcher in computer science, early pioneer, uh, and he published this. How many projects do you think he used to validate this cone? One? How many? Actually, zero. He, he published it and said, this is subjective. I mean, it was based on his idea of what it was, but it, he had no actual data when he published this. Uh, he republished it uh, about 10 years later. And how many projects did he, and he, and he validated it with a couple of projects. How many did he validate it with? What? So he had seven projects that he ran at University of Southern California, a university program. Uh, they were all the same program, project. And he had one time estimate that he had from it. And actually, if you go really deeply into it, the, the, the methodology is, is quite flawed. Uh, he also had five, four bids, four or five bids, I think, that he had for Department of Defense. So overall, there were about 12 projects and 12 data estimation points. And from that, it was declared that this is absolutely validated. Um, let's see. <laughs> the other thing, though, I think that's interesting is, is just want to point out that. He did pull out this 4x. That 4x behavior, you know, sort of around the concept of operation, that, that, you know, he was subjectively thinking that was about what it was, and it looks like, uh, you know, our data is also telling us that's about the same. So I had a whole bunch of data at Landmark, and so I plotted this up. Uh, it's a little bit different because the timeline I used was not, in, in, the, in the cone of uncertainty, it's, it's these phases, and in my case, it's relative time. So I put everything on the same relative time basis. And so I get something. It looks a little bit like a cone. Um, it's half a cone, maybe. Uh, what's that telling us? 
Well, it's telling us we've got a very strong bias towards optimism. That's one of the things. And it tells us that it does get, it does actually converge. And, that, and, the, and the reality is that it, it's almost guaranteed to converge. Well, it is guaranteed to converge if you're only looking at projects that ship. Because when you ship, there's no uncertainty. Once you've shipped, you have no uncertainty. But I looked at this and I said, OK, that tells me something. But does it tell me anything really useful? Because what's the real business question we're asking? And the real business question is, how much work do we have left to do and when will we ship? You know, in The Wizard of Oz, we've got this witch, and she's going to do something really nasty to us when the hourglass is empty. Am I looking at it? Do I care how much sand there is that's already passed? Not too much. I care about how much time is left. So what I want to look at is what's my uncertainty of what I have left, not what's the uncertainty in what I've already done, because what I've already done has no uncertainty. So I plotted this differently. I said, what's the remaining uncertainty, and how does my profile change? And I no longer have a cone. Right? In fact, I pretty much have a pipe. It stays pretty much the same all the way through. That was what I found with my data. Now, subsequently, of course, I've uh, been working with a uh, Dutch racer, Chris Verhoff, and uh, Lawrence Evelyns. They have actually got a lot more data than I had, and, and they've, they've found that there are, there are several patterns. Uh, some patterns where there does converge some. There are some patterns where it actually diverges and gets worse as you get further away. In any event, you actually, if you go back to the original cone, it will, it will converge. But the, what, I, what I'm finding in general is that unless you're taking active things to, to change it, the uncertainty that's remaining really doesn't change. You still have the same, same relative uncertainty. So let's look at why that might be. If I look at a set of stories, each one of these stories has some uncertainty associated with it. And if I've properly used things like the invest principle to keep them separate, when I do one story, what's happened? I've removed the uncertainty in that story. What's happened to the remaining stories? Really nothing. All the uncertainty of the remaining stories is still there. And that just continues. So if I look at only the remaining part, there's no reason for uncertainty to, to get less. The le it's really, in a relative perspective, the same amount. So if I'm one month away from the project, from, from where I think I'm going to be done, there's no reason, and, and I've historically been you know, a 4x type organization, my chance of success is somewhere between one to four months. And there's no reason to think that that's going to be drastically reduced. So if we look at this from a perspective of is accuracy significantly improving as the project progresses, if we go to the real business question we're asking of what's left, I think this is, this is pretty much busted. So number three, uh, estimations are frequently impacted by biases, and these biases can be significant. First, go back to our, the data. There's a clear optimism bias here. We're, we're, we're only looking at, at the upper half of the cone. So yes, absolutely, there's an optimism bias. Let's look at another bias. This is some more work by Mungne Jorgensen. Um, he took the exact same specification to four different groups. So group D is our control group, and he gave them no guidance whatsoever. And they came back and said it's 160 hours of work to do this activity. Group A was told the guidance was 800 hours. They thought, this is, here's a project, and by the way, we think it's about 800 hours. Group B, same thing, this is the project, and it's going to be about 40 hours. And group C, same project, pretty easy, we think it's about four hours. So what sort of results do you think we got? What did we get from group A? They were told 800, what would they get? 1,000? <laughs> okay. okay. Any other guesses? No other guesses, huh? Okay. So 300, I, I thought that was a good way to say Okay, so anyway, 300 from the 800 group. Uh, the 40 group said no, we, you know, they went up to 100. Uh, group four said you're kidding, and the one that was told four, you're kidding, it's, it's really 60. You know, lo and behold, that's still way below what uh, would have been otherwise. Two, as, two aspects here are going on, I think. One is a concept called anchoring. Uh, I've heard it a couple times at this conference. Uh, the idea of anchoring is if I start in with a number, and use that, then when I am told to do something, I'm sort of got myself anchored in that perspective, and so my results are influenced by that. Uh, so that's one part of it. I think the other part of it that happens is that because software is, is a very malleable thing, uh, 
the people that were given the guidance of 800 are probably going to think, well, they want something more than, than what I see in the specification. Uh, similarly, you can, you can always take the simple way to do it or the more complicated way to do it, and that's going to influence things as well. Uh, but these types of biases can be very significant. They did a number of other studies, just changing a little bit of words here and there, and got vastly different results. So what would look like it was the same, same set of specifications ended up with quite different estimates. Um, so, What's that? Yeah, this was a group saying just in general, you're, you're estimating for this group. So it was the same, it, um, the same set of group, or same, they were estimating for the same group. They were, it was estimators that were doing the work. And it was, in, it was a group that they were using. So it was the same pool. So they normalized based on that, yes. The only thing that was different really was the person doing the estimation itself. Yeah, in this case, they were using an estimator rather than the actual people doing the work. So the est it was a professional estimator doing the work. As a so you could say that if it was actual development teams, I think if you did this with actual development teams, you would get the same You would get very similar results. The, the, the behavior is it was going to be this. The, the, the types of things that are shown in the experiment, I think you would replicate in other places. Um, and that's because what gets us into trouble is not so much what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> so these biases are, are, can be very significant, and they, they can Im impact your estimations quite a bit. So here's one of the agile things. We say we're pretty good at estimating things relatively. There's an example of it. Um, let's take a look. So Jurgensen also, did, anchoring I just talked about a little bit, this is one of the problems we have uh, with relative estimation is the fact that it, whatever we start from is an anchor for what we're, we're doing relative estimation on. Um, Jurgensen did some other work in this area. And the problem is when you do it, because of anchoring, A relative to B is not symmetric with B relative to A. Okay? This is the challenge we have. An example, he did a number of examples, some with software, uh, some with just general, general questions. You get the things like, uh, Austria's population is 70% of Hungary's when we're using Austria relative to Hungary, while Hungary's population is 80% of Austria's with Hungary relative to Austria. So both are less than each other. It, it's nonsensical, right? But that's the type of behavior that, that you get uh, as a cause of the, the anchoring. The data that's often, or the, the study that's often referenced to by agilists as to uh, relative estimation, it's an excellent piece of work by Eduardo uh, Miranda, uh, but it looks absolutely nothing like any of the relative estimation approaches that we use. It's, this is a, actually a very, very complicated pairwise uh, estimation process, and it goes through a fair number of, of uh, moderately complicated mathematics. It would be much more complicated than I think I would see in any Agile team, because most Agile teams are taking approach towards doing it simpler and simpler, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so, I'm not saying relative estimation is bad in any way. Uh, I do have my concerns about it. So let's look at this particular one. This is one I think is, is interesting because it's using an example to point it out. We're pretty good at estimating things relatively. And it says this is about twice as big. So the big, the big one is about twice as big as the small one. How many people think that's about right? Big one's about twice as big as the small one. Look about right? All right, anyone else have suggestions? Not twice as big? Same size? Four times? Why do you think four times? Width and height? Okay. Close. What about depth? <laughs> I, I'd say this is low by 4x, right? That it's 8 to 1. Because the problem is, the mind, this is actually a problem with the mind. The mind is visually trained to work well in one dimension. We think, and, and actually it overemphasizes height over width. So if you get a glass, and you have a very tall glass, and, and most restaurants and things know this, if you've got a very tall glass, it looks like it holds a lot more than a very thick, very, very, uh, thick and, and wide glass, when in fact they often have the same. So the mind plays tricks on us with relative estimation. 
Uh, my view of this is relative, I'm not saying relative estimation is bad, because I think it's actually just about the same. It's just that we're not, if I were to look at it specifically, we're pretty good at estimating things relatively. No, I think we suck, we just suck in relatively different ways, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's busted. But, now we're gonna come to the reason why we do relative estimation. Uh, velocity throughput is a good tool for adjusting estimates. And this, uh, you know, I get my team, one of the things I find amazing about um, teams doing agile development is, is that how few of them can actually produce this, which is, of course, a uh, release burnup chart. Um, people focus on so many different things, trying to get all sorts of things right, and they miss one of the most important things, which is telling me, as a business person, I want to know where am I at and when am I going to be done? These are pretty simple questions that business people have. And what do we do? We spend all sorts of time tracking tasks. We do all sorts of things to make sure our iterations are meeting our deadlines. Does a business person really care about iterations? Not so much. I mean, I care about the business object that delivers value at the end. You know, the fact that I've got an iteration, if I'm in continuous delivery, continuous deployment, yeah, then, then I want to know how things are going through all the time. But if I'm in a situation where most uh, projects are where there's a final delivery and then something's mobilized. I care about that mobilization object. And when that's mobilized, that's what matters. So giving this type of picture and showing the ability to look at how's the team's velocity project projecting out and how is scope creep projecting out, I can get a nice intersection and it'll give me a very, very good thing. Velocity's pretty good for that. What it, and what it's really good at um, predominantly is removing bias. That's its primary function, is to remove the optimism bias. Because it's not a silver bullet. It actually doesn't help us that much with uncertainty, and why? Because our uncertainty is still there. So the uncertainty is still there, but what it's helped us with is to remove the bias, and remove the bias, and also to help us inc incorporate in uh, scope creep. So is, it, so is it a tool for they're improving things? Yes, absolutely. So now we go on to, we're a bit behind, but we'll make it up in testing, since most of our uncertainty was in the features. Everyone seemed to think that was going to happen. So this is an article by uh, a, pa a, a paper by Lankow, Estimating Software Project uh, Effort, an empirical study. Uh, and other than the picture, well, the picture wasn't in, the, in, the, uh, in there, but it's one. Um, but I love this article for three reasons. There's three great reasons why I love this article. Uh, first, she references my work, which I think that's awesome. Uh, second, she more or less comes with the same conclusions that I did, that, that uh, uh, the estimation process ends up with a log normal distribution. Uh, but third, I learned something new, because she had a slightly different data than I did. And that is that she had data for both features and bugs, and was looking at the comparison and, and compared that data uh, between features and bugs. And what she found, or actually what the data showed, and, and uh, when I looked at it with it, is that the uncertainty in a defect is about twice as great as the uncertainty of a feature. Why is that? Well, with features, we can actually pretty much get our hands around what a feature is. With a defect, we're trying to do deep, we don't know what we're looking for, right? So they may not be big problems, but when it's a big problem, it's really nasty. And the uncertainty is great. So what it means, a couple things what this means. It means if you're deferring your defects till the end, you're putting a lot of uncertainty at the end. And we know that, right? Get your defects dealt with early, find them fast, remove them. This is actually probably more important of a feature, of an issue than what's often reported as, you know, the cost of when you fix the bug. Because, you know, from an overall management perspective, you're trying to understand, where's my uncertainty? Can I pull that in? Can I get rid of that uncertainty early? So I think, you know, we know this one's busted. So scope creep is a major source of estimation error. Let's see how this plays out. We want this! And that, we demand a share in that, and most of that, some of this, and f***ing all of that. Less of that, and more of this, and f***ing plenty of this. Another thing, we want it now. I want it yesterday, I want f***ing more tomorrow. And the demands will all be changed then, so f***ing stay awake. Yeah. A little bit of scope creep. Um, so what is, what is the challenge of scope creep? Well, so. Capers Jones has been recording a lot of data, and there's some people who have a little bit of uh, concern over the type of data he's collecting. But in general, I think it's a good perspective to start from. He says it's a, if you, the average project, if you have nothing else, you could look at 
is about 2% per month in scope creep, uh, which if you look at it projected out, gives you almost 20, it's about 27% per year. And you know, that's pro I, I've looked at that and it's not too bad for what I, I see. So as a, as a starting point, that's what I look at. Um, what I find a lot of teams do when they're looking at a project, they say, well, this is about our story points that we have, you know, and this is our velocity that we, our team has been able to do, our gross velocity. Now, this is total points we're delivering. And they say, well, then take the existing story points and divide by the, the velocity, and they say, I'm going to project out this. What they have totally ignored is the scope creep. They've not even included, you know, if you've got to look at the importance of net velocity, net velocity is far more important than gross velocity. Okay? One of the key things, I see too many, all too many teams that, that are doing this. And they've got to include it. And if nothing else, just utilize your, assume that your net velocity is going to be decreased by an increase of scope of 2% per month. I'll, I'll go through an example of this a little bit later. Uh, the, the impact of this 2% scope creep per month, the thing is it gets worse the farther out your project is. So if you look at something, you know, if you look at how much impact it has over, over if we're out here in the 30 month project, we're going to end up, if we didn't include it, we're going to look at this, you know, 4x type, type of behavior. It's huge. Which is why this is a report from the Standish Group, also published by Craig Larman, of project success versus project duration. Now, in this case, success is defined by the chaos definition. Chaos definition is delivery on time. But if you look at, if you look at this sort of a, uh, over time, if your project is up to 36 months, your chance of success goes down to zero. Your chance of being on time based on that, based on the database that they have, um, pretty awful. Yeah? So that's one of the reasons we try to keep things short in an agile cycle, is keep the shorter we can get it, uh, the better chance we have controlling it. So scope creep is a source of estimation error. Uh, you yeah, know, that's pretty much confirmed. So number eight, having more estimators, even if they're not experts, uh, improves estimation accuracy. Pull out my prop here. So this is an exercise I've, I've done, and usually if I have more time for this session, I would uh, include it in this session. Uh, I'm gonna be doing a game tomorrow, so if you're here and wanna uh, participate in some of the uh, fun stuff we're gonna do there, we'll be doing an estimation exercise of uh, jelly beans in a jar. Do this for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, it's a good estimation exercise. Uh, it also uh, shows the power of, of uh, potentially groups getting involved in it. Uh, but one of the important things I find from doing it, that I, one of the unexpected consequences of it, that when I started doing it, is I realized really how bad we are at estimating even something simple as, as jelly beans. So I've just anchored you with bad. So how bad do you think we are how, in terms of uh, uh, estimation? No? Anyone want to venture up? If I looked at sort of the range between the 90% and the 10%, the highs and the low, how much difference do you think there would be in, in uh, estimation as a ratio between the high and the low? Anyone want to offer anything up? 70%? Okay. We got 70%, I'll go straight to it. Six to one. Six to one between the high and the low. So when we're estimating jelly beans, and I've, I've repeated this consistently, uh, if you get a group of about 20, or you know, I've, I've done it probably close to 10 times, groups anywhere from 20 to 100 people, and just do a, a uh, have them do this, I end up with a very consistent uh, distribution, it tends to be log normal, or very close to log normal, where the worst case, the 90% is about six to one, six times higher. So if I had an estimate of, of a, a 40 on the low end, I'd be something like uh, 240 on the high end. Uh, that's when individuals do the work. I then get groups together, so groups of about six or seven. When they do that, their ratio goes down to two to one. And if I just take the average of the crowd, and then I compare average of crowd versus another average of crowd, that range goes down to about one and a half. So plus or minus, closer to the plus, yeah. This includes, yeah, it includes not experts. I mean, there's no, yeah, I mean, anyone an expert at, at jelly bean estimation? <laughs> so it's not experts. So this is one of the things. It, 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 you would think that this would be pretty easy. I mean, it, it would be a pretty easy thing. I, I always work with business people as this one as well. I have business people do this, and they, they come up with these numbers, and they do the same thing, or, uh, you know, six to one, or sometimes worse. Um, and I say, okay, so is this easier or harder than estimating software? Okay. 
you know, easier, right? And software, we were able to get four to one. Okay, so you know, it's it's a correct. So you would think this is easier. Now, the granted, I do this in five. You know, I give them about five minutes, so I don't give them a lot of time. Software, we do software, we get at least ten minutes to do our estimates, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, so th this is written up really well in the Wisdom of Crowds by uh, James Sirowiecki, uh, and that's sort of what the, the uh, source of where I started working the experiment. Um, it was interesting to come across this book because I had read this other book called The Extraordinary, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. So here we have one side, which is the Wisdom of Crowds, and another part, another guy, which wrote this back in the 1700s, I think, uh, on the madness of crowds. So are crowds, are they crowds wise or are crowds mad? And the reality is that they can be either way. Um, so the, some examples here on the wisdom of the crowd is jelly bean estimation, uh, the who wants to be a millionaire. The, the most accurate thing to do is the, is the audience, um, ask the audience type of thing, which is uh, get the 91% correct answer. The examples on the madness of crowds are things like sometimes stock markets go mad. Uh, the Dutch tulip mania in the 1670, uh, 1637, where an individual adult, Tulip bulb was worth multiple millions of dollars. Um, just craziness. And, I, and the reality, so, so crowds can go totally mad or they can be incredibly smart. And the key part is diversity. If a, if a crowd has diversity, it will tend towards being really smart. If a crowd does not have diversity, it can go off into groupthink and be totally crazy. So the idea is bringing in multiple opinions, making sure that those multiple opinions are diverse. Uh, this is an example I've used with some teams is to, you know, ask the team and get a distribution from the team as to where they are. So ask them individually, anonymously, and then plot this out. And this is just an you know, incremental distribution. So in this case, we've got, a, we've got some groupings here. We've got some distribution we, that tells us something. Um, it also tells us sort of a, you know, a range of where it could be. And it gives us also the possibility to have some conversations. I think in Jeff's talk yesterday, there's something about uh, you, can look, you can get stuff, stuff from data, but you can't get the empathy. And actually, in this case, you don't have to be a rocket science to get some, uh, some really interesting information from this. You get some uh, patterns here. So who do you think that was? That's all the developers. That's all the testers. And that's the test manager. <laughs> Not on my watch. Um, so you get a little, you get some, but what, you, what this worked out with this particular team is this was a great conversation because the developers had no clue as to why the testers were worried. And then they got together and actually have, they're having this, they had the framework to have a conversation and they worked pretty well and they came in, they came in pretty much at that inflection point. So in general, having more estimators, even if they're not experts, uh, improving estimation actors, that's pretty well confirmed. There are some, you know, you have to have just enough knowledge, but you don't have to be experts. And getting more people involved is, is generally a good idea. So project success is determined by on-time delivery. So certainly that's how things like Standish Group says, yeah, on-time delivery, that's the important thing. And they give this like, often reported uh, challenged projects that didn't meet their date. But why do we really care about on-time delivery? Is that what we really care about? One tool I use for this is something called the cost of delay. What I want to do is I want to have the adult conversation as to what it really means to be late. What's going to happen? Is everything going to go, is the world going to fall apart if we don't deliver? Are we in a situation where the market, the market forces are such? Maybe in the US around Christmas season, if I'm a game company and I don't deliver in the market window, I'm in real trouble. But on the other hand, I could be, have a very good uh, position with a product, not really strong competitive forces, and if I'm a little bit late, it's not going to have a big impact. So it's really important to have that conversation with the team as to how does the market value fall off relative to the date. And if you have that, we have the, the story, you know, this idea in, in Agile sometimes comes up, oh, the delivery date is fixed. Whatever scope we have is exactly what we're going to deliver. Who's making that call? Is that a really, is, the business, is that an intelligent business decision? It may or may not be. It's just sub-optimizing on one thing, saying delivery date's the important thing. What's really important is we're trying to make 
you know, solve an essentially complex, uncertain differential equation as to what's more important when we deliver or satisfying customers. All right? Sometimes you get your priorities wrong. Uh, this is the Ford Taurus. Back in the 1980s, Ford was a struggling automotive company. And the Ford Taurus, the first version of the Ford Taurus came out. Project manager said, I'm going to make sure this is good. Did all sorts of focus groups, all sorts of things to make sure quality was in great shape. Did all the things we think was really important to get the product right. Car was a huge success, saved Ford Motor Company. But it was six months late. What happened to the project manager? Fired, demoted, it's, I mean, recording history is not hard, easy to tell, but anyway, not, not rewarded is the, is the important part. So they go on with round two of the Ford, Taurus, new project manager. What do you think he did? Delivered on time, right? Cut all sorts of corners. No focus group, ah, don't need those, it's gonna hit our schedule. Quality, ah, quality's good enough. We're gonna hit the schedule. Now, what do you think happened from a market perspective? <laughs> Not very good, right? So you gotta make sure your priorities are right. Look at this, this is one uh, thing I look at. A poker metric, do you think, if I were to say I'm going to have a metric called percentage of hands won, you think that's a good metric? Percentage of hands won? Good? Not good? Well, it turns out it's actually a pretty good metric for determining who's the loser. Right? <laughs> because what do you have to do to win hands in poker? You have to stay in. You have to, you, if, you, if you, the really good poker players, do not play many hands. They get out early, right? And in order to win, you have to stay in, right? So if I were to just arbitrarily say that's the important metric, I'd be in trouble. Where we say on time percentage is an important one. Uh, this is some data I included in my paper. The really ugly red project there is Microsoft Windows Word, WinWord 1.0. Anyone remember WinWord? Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, anyone remember what the, wor the Old enough to remember the uh, word processor market back when WinWord came out? It was a while ago, maybe. So. WordPerfect was a dominant player in the marketplace. WinWord was a brand new product. It was going to come out on a brand new operating system, Microsoft Windows. But it was horrendously late. It was, always, it was one of those, we have to be out in one year projects that ended up taking four years. But if you look at it, WinWord took over market share very rapidly. So it was late, but from a value delivery perspective, enormous. So I like to work more towards value metrics than uh, uh, cost metrics. Uh, Douglas Hubbard says that our industry is totally messed up in terms of what we look at. Uh, we tend to look at the most measure tends to be the lowest information value, such as cost and time. But what's really important is things that value delivery, and we just tend to not not measure it. And part of the problem we don't measure it is because it's a lagging thing. It's hard to measure and it, and it tends to lag. So instead we measure the thing that's easy but useless. So if we look at outcomes and out, or outputs and outcomes, uh, Jeff talked about this yesterday. Uh, if we're bad and, and uh, or we, we're late and we produce a bad product, yeah, we're pretty much on thin ice. Uh, we're a rock star if we've got on, on time and, and a great outcome. If we've got this good outcome, like the Ford Taurus, and we're late, uh, I can't predict anything because politics is more difficult than physics. <laughs> but if we're uh, on time and produce something bad, we call that crap on time. <laughs> and, and you joke, we actually had, there was a time in the company that was one, where our customers were saying, oh, you got the crap on time. And it wasn't the thing you want your customers saying. So project success determined by on-time delivery, uh, yeah, not so much. So estimation is waste. Um, you got to go back to the real business questions. Is it worth doing? Uh, what's the priority? What's the target time to ship? What's the critical scope? Do we have the right investment? What's the cost to delay? 
If your estimation is answering those questions and you're doing just enough to get the answers to those questions, then your estimation is potentially, that's what you should, you know, that's pretty good. If you're doing estimation that's well beyond that, it most likely is waste. So is estimation waste? Uh, it's plausible. I mean, I think I, I like a lot of what I'm seeing from the no estimates camp. Um, I'm still curious as to how, you know, how it all works. My perspective is you do just enough estimation in order to do things to answer those questions, particularly to prioritization. Um, you know, if I see people from the no estimates camp, they say, well, we don't do estimation, but we do prioritization. Well, if you're doing prioritization, you are doing estimation of some form, one or another. So, you know, prioritization and estimation I see as just two sides of the, of the same coin. So now what? So I think we're out of time, which is uh, not a surprise. I have a little bit more that, that I go through. I'll be going through it tomorrow at the, uh, at the game. So I leave you in suspense now as to, you know, I scared the hell out of you because we have to do all this estimation. And I have a simple answer to how, what to do <laughs> and what I've used that works really well. Uh, we're, gonna, we're actually going to live it in the uh, simulation game tomorrow. So if uh, anyone's uh, still here tomorrow and wants to be involved in that, uh, that'd be good. But I think I am supposed to be done now, right? All right, thanks. And I've got happy to talk any questions. Um,